Amen. All right, so now that y'all know that my husband is amazing, let me tell you about one time, this one little time, that uh, it wasn't so amazing. So he did give me permission to tell this story, and because he's so awesome, I feel like it's okay to share with y'all, because it won't change the way y'all think of him. So back when we were dating, we're about six months in at this point, and we already are through the I love you stage. We, we love each other, okay? Six months in, we already knew this is who I wanna marry. We, we were going kind of fast, but we knew. So there's this one night, we're on a date, and Christian and I were long distance, so he was back from Auburn. That's where he went to college, and we're having a date. Let's go, War Eagle. So we're having a little date night, and as we're talking, he's telling me about how one of his best friends just started dating someone, and he was so excited about it. And I was like, oh, that's awesome. And I was like, well, I gotta go follow her on Instagram because now we're gonna be best friends, right? So I go to her Instagram page, follow her, and somehow, instead of being on her actual feed, I was on her tagged photos. So the first picture I click on was her last photo that she was tagged in. So I start scrolling, and I'm like, huh, this is a different girl's page, but whatever, now I'm already into it. So I'm looking at the different pictures, and as I'm scrolling to about the sixth slide in this series that this random girl posts on her Instagram, I see a picture from two weeks ago of my boyfriend's arm around this random girl I don't know. And I'm like, hold up. <laughs> so we're just eating dinner. I'm eating my fried rice, looking at this. And I just look up and go, who's this? <laughs> and where is this? And what is this, right? And he goes, this first thing he said, y'all, he said, I told her not to post that. I'm like, wait, what? I'm like, this was bad and now it's real bad. And so I'm like, well, you excuse me as I go to the bathroom because I just had to gather myself. So I come back and I'm like, hold up. Okay, so first of all, I don't know who this person is, but second of all, you told her not to post this, so you know this is bad. And he's like, well, it was really no big deal at all. I mean, literally it was all my friends and it was her going away party and we've known each other since high school and it was literally not a big deal at all. And I'm like, yeah, 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 okay, 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 cool. But why did you tell her not to post it? If it's not a big deal, if it wasn't anything, why didn't you tell me about it? If it wasn't anything, why would you tell this girl not to post that? And clearly she did post it with the instruction to not post it, so what is that saying? You see why I'm struggling here, right? You see what this, every girl in here is like, yes, girl, yes. <laughs> he is like, yes, keep digging. So I keep digging, I'm like, there, there is something here. He never lets up. It's no big deal, I promise it was not a big deal. I told her not to post it because I just, I just knew if you saw that it would look like a big deal, but it wasn't a big deal. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Well, weeks go by, I'm still bringing it up. Why, I mean, we're in the car, why did you tell her not to post it? We're in the movie, why did you tell her not to post it? I mean, we, why would you, you know, always, why did you tell her? Then finally, I was convicted. Love keeps no record of wrongs, so I had to let it go. I'm like, whatever, I will never know why this mystery has happened, but if I'm gonna love this man, I must let this go. There's no more bringing up this question as to why. I just gotta lay that one down. So I lay it down, this was in January. So now let's fast forward all the way till September. We're two months out from getting married. We are in Auburn, we're hanging out with all his friends, we go back, and I'm like, hey, I'm gonna take a nap, I'm so tired. I take a nap on the couch, wake up to Christian right beside me shaking. He's just shaking. And I'm like, hey. He's like, I lied to you. And I'm like, what? And y'all, I'm so scared, because we are literally two months away from getting married at this point. He's shaking, he says he lied to me. I don't know where this is going, no context for what is about to come out of this man's mouth. And he goes, I didn't tell her not to post it. <laughs> I'm like, what? Back in January, like this is so far gone. And I'm like, why in the world are you bringing this up now? And why in the world did you tell me that you told her not to post it, which is the main thing I have been hung up on for months of my life, and that you never even said that? You just went to the party, took a picture, and she posted it. You never even said the part I was so mad about. And he was like, yeah. You know, that was weird, you know? <laughs> and, and you know what he said? He said a couple of things. He said, 
I just didn't want that to hurt. I knew that was gonna hurt you when you saw that. I didn't know, she, I never would have thought she was gonna post it and I didn't want that to hurt you and I thought it would have sounded better if I told you that I wish it didn't happen. So I'm like, okay. But then he said, <laughs> but then he said this and this is what I was like, wow. He said, to be honest, Sadie, I said that so many times, I actually forgot that that wasn't true. I actually forgot that that was a lie. I actually started to believe that I actually did say that because I had gotten so used to saying that that I forgot that that wasn't even true. And I started thinking about that. And I'm like, you know what? That's a really concerning thing. When you can get so comfortable with a lie that you're sharing, that you actually forget that it's a lie in the first place and it actually becomes the truth. And it's really scary when you live in a generation that is entitled to their own truth, where everybody wants to have my own truth, my truth, what's your truth? And we can all have different truths, but yet we all have these truths, but they might actually all be rooted on a bunch of lies. Like we might be saying it's my truth and it's my truth and it's my truth and actually believe that it really is my truth, but when you circle back to why it even became your truth, it's actually all found on a lie. And that's actually really concerning. And you know what's crazy? If everybody can have their own truth, how does that even make sense? How is that even true anymore? Because I don't know if this is crazy to y'all, but maybe we need to be reminded that the truth is powerful because it's true. Isn't that true? Like the truth is only powerful because it's true, but now it's actually, it doesn't even have to be true. If it's your truth, no one can argue it. Urban Dictionary's definition of my truth is literally this, a non-negotiable personal opinion. That's the top rated definition of Urban Dictionary for my truth, a non-negotiable personal opinion. And the reason why it says my truth is so popular is because people can argue your opinion, but no one can argue your truth. And that's really scary. That we are so entitled to our opinion that instead of even saying it's just an opinion, we're now saying it's our truth so that no one can tell me anything different. There's two verses in Proverbs that come to mind when I think about this and the problem that says, one, it says a fool is right in their own eye, but the wise listen to instruction. I don't wanna be a generation of fools that just think we are so right, you cannot tell me I'm wrong and I'm gonna prove that by saying it's my truth and you can't argue the truth because the truth is the truth. There's another one that says, there's a path that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. So there is a path that can seem right to you, but that doesn't mean you're on the right path. In the end, that can lead to death. I wanted to remind y'all tonight that there is a big difference between my truth and the truth. There is a big difference between your truth and the truth. And the power of the two are way different. The power that your truth holds compared to the truth is completely different. And I hope to break that down a little bit tonight so at the end of this you can realize why in the world would you wanna stand on the grounds of your own shaky truth when you can stand on the solid ground of the way and the truth and the life. See, Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one gets to the Father. And I assume a lot of people in here who have come to church, your goal is to get to the Father. Your goal is to get to heaven. Your goal is to get with the Lord. And the only way to get there is not through your truth. It's through the truth, Jesus Christ. So I wanna read us a passage in John where the truth was kind of a little confusing, a little up for grabs. So it's John 18, and at this point, Jesus had already been, you know, uh, captured, taken, and they originally took him to the Jewish headquarters where um, they were seeing the Jewish people and Jewish rulers, but basically the Jewish rulers were saying, look, let's expedite this process. 
We want this guy dead. And the reason they wanted Jesus dead is because Jesus was really rubbing um, up against a lot of the things that the Jews stood for. What Louis was talking about earlier today, if you were here, if you've heard his message, like it was so different than the law that they had known for their whole life, what Jesus was actually presenting. See, Jesus was there for relationship. Jesus was there and he was healing the blind and he was healing the sick and he was you know, turning over tables in the temple, all this crazy stuff. He was healing people on the Sabbath and that was really making them mad because that was really uncomfortable to them. That was really a problem to them. And so they were done with him. They're like, we gotta get this dude, we gotta capture this dude, but we don't just want him captured, we want him dead. And so they knew because in Jewish culture, they didn't really kill people or if anything, they stoned people. They said, we're gonna bring him to the Romans because the Romans will crucify him. And so Jesus is now taken from the Jewish people to now the Roman leader, which is Pilate. And Pilate's trying to figure out why are you here? Like, why did they bring you to us? You must have done something really bad if you're brought to us, that they wanted to go so far as to kill you. So this is the conversation we're having with Jesus and Pilate. So Pilate entered the headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, do you say this of your own accord or did someone else say this to you about me? And Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Your own nation and chief priests had delivered you over to me. What have you done? So he's like, what have you done? I mean, you must have done something terrible. When in reality, we know what Jesus was doing. Jesus was doing incredible things, except for it really bothered the Jews. So he's like, what did you do? And Jesus said, my kingdom was not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not of this world. Then Pilate said to him, so are you a king? And Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. For this purpose I was born and for this purpose I've come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is in the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate said to him, what is truth? So Pilate's like, well, what is true? And you see his predicament. I mean, this is obviously confusing because here are the Jews saying, this man's so bad, he needs to be crucified. And here's Jesus saying, my kingdom's not even of this world. I'm not here to, to fight you. If my kingdom was in this world, then my servants would be fighting for me. I'm just here to bear witness to the truth. And he's like, well, th what is true here? It, are they right? Are you right? What is true? And so it says, after he said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I found no guilt in this man. So right here, if we stop for a second, Pilate already kind of knew what was true. This man's not guilty. There is no guilt in this man. And so then he says this, but you have a custom that I should release one man for you at Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Pilate's like, isn't this obvious? You can release one man, isn't this obvious? Because this man's not guilty, this man's innocent. I really find no guilt in him, should we just release him? And then they cry out, not this man, but Barabbas. And Barabbas was a robber. Now y'all, I think we hear that story so much and you already knew that that was gonna happen. You already knew that they released Barabbas and not Jesus. But like, if you think about it, that is crazy. Like, it's crazy that I actually got to that point where here he is and Pilate's like, there is no guilt in this man. He has literally done nothing wrong. He might be bothering y'all. He might be, you know, annoying y'all, but he has not done anything worthy of being crucified. But this man, on the other hand, he's a robber. He's done all kinds of crazy things. And so isn't it pretty obvious we're gonna crucify him? And they're like, no, not this man. We want Barabbas, give us Barabbas. That's crazy. And so when I look at that, I'm like, why did they choose Barabbas over Jesus? Well, obviously, let's acknowledge that there's a lot of prophecy and God's plan is over all things. And so there is a reason that that all happened. But if you think about it from the crowd's perspective, why did they choose Barabbas? There are two things I want us to look at. One, I think because it had a lot to do with their feelings. And here's the thing when it comes to your own truth. If your truth is gonna be measured on the basis of your feelings, it will always choose what is most comfortable in a moment. It's always gonna choose what is most comfortable in a moment rather than what's best for you in the long run. So essentially they were saying, we would rather have Barabbas because we can't handle what Jesus is doing. We cannot handle how annoying this is that he's doing all the things against the law. We'd rather have the one who will literally destroy our city. We'd rather have the one who would still, we'd rather have it more comfortable in the moment when it's best for us in the long run. 
And when you look at that story, you're like, that's crazy. But when we think about it in your own life, we make decisions all the time based off of what's comfortable in the moment as opposed to what's best for us in the long run. You see, we know it's probably not a good idea to go out with all our friends and go drinking and party and all this stuff, but it's more comfortable in a moment to just go and hang out with everybody and deal with the consequences later, right? It's more comfortable whenever, you know, you're feeling like going on the internet and numbing yourself and looking at social media, even though you know later it's gonna make you feel terrible. It's more comfortable to look at pornography. It's more comfortable to be in that relationship. It's more comfortable to do things in a moment than it will be in the long run. And so if you don't have a basis of truth that is outside just your personal feelings, you're always gonna wanna choose the thing that's most comfortable in a moment. You see, there's a difference between objective and subjective truth. I've been kind of reading this and learning about this. And I know it seems silly to just dive into this conversation, but I think it's worth the reminder. So let's do an analogy. Let's say Olivia, in this analogy, is gonna represent someone who's gonna stand on objective truth. And let's say Sally in this analogy is gonna stand on subjective truth. So Olivia goes to Dancing Goats this morning coffee and she goes, Sally, that is the best coffee in the world. It's the best coffee in the world. And Sally goes, no, Starbucks is the best coffee in the world. And they go, well, you know, we can't both be right. So let's Google what is actually the best coffee in the world, voted by everybody in the world. What is the best coffee? And as they Google this, they see that Buddy the Elf is right. That the place in New York City has the best coffee in the entire world. Who knew? He was right the whole time. And what Olivia does with that information, she goes, man, Dancing Goats was really good. But I guess this place in New York City is better. That's the best coffee in the world. And she now changes her opinion to what it actually is. Sally goes, nope, <laughs> Starbucks is still the best. It will always be the best. I will always go to Starbucks. You see, what Olivia was able to do is she was able to say, even though this feels the best, even though that looked the best, even though I thought that tasted the best, what is actually the best is this place in New York City. So I'll forget what I think I know is best and I'll actually hold true to what is best and I'm gonna go to New York City to get the absolute best. And what Sally would say is, I don't even care what they say. I know what's the best. It is Starbucks. Who even knows? That thing is so outdated on Google. It doesn't even matter. I would rather have what feels better, what I'm used to, what I'm accustomed to, than actually what might be best for my life. And you see, that's what we do sometimes with scripture. We're like, yeah, you know, that might be good, but how outdated is that? I would rather go off of my truth because I know what's best for my life. I know the decisions I wanna make for my life. Who cares what they say, I know. But what we should be saying is even though this feels good, even though this might look good, when I compare it to what the Lord has for my life, I choose to surrender what I think feels good in a moment and actually balance the mission to what God has for my life in the long run. You have to be able to say, God, you're a better God than me. You know better for me. Your truth is better than my truth. And so you have to be able to look at this word and say, you know, I might be wrong. It might just feel good because it's what culture's told me is good. It might just feel good because I've gotten so used to that. It might just feel good because it's, and I'm not gonna base my truth based off of my feelings. Well, some of you might say, Sadie, it doesn't even feel good anymore. I, I go to church every Sunday and partying to me, it doesn't feel good anymore, but I keep doing it. It doesn't even feel good to me anymore to look at my phone, but I keep doing it. It's not my feelings, it's just, I just can't stop. I had a moment the other day with a college student that I'm really good friends with, and I kind of heard about some of the decisions she was making with her life. I know she's a believer and we're good friends, and so I said, I'm gonna go talk to her. So I went and talked to her, I said, hey friend, um, I've been hearing some of the stuff that you've been doing. And I said, what's up with that? You're better than that, you know? And she said, wow. She said, I'm so glad you said that to me. She said, because I've honestly just been really confused. She said, I know that's not good for me, but all of my friends who are also Christians are doing it. So I've kind of just gotten to the point where I'm like, I guess it's not that bad. And I told her that, I said, you cannot compare convictions to anyone else. You are responsible for your convictions. You are responsible for the way that the Spirit moves in your heart to deny your flesh and say yes to the Spirit. 
There is a moment, my uh, sister Rebecca, she's so funny, she's from Taiwan, but she's lived here uh, for a long time. Gosh, she came when she was 16, and now she's in her 30s, married, has two kids, and she's just awesome. And, but one day she came over, and if anyone's been to Louisiana in the summer, or y'all are from Georgia, y'all get it, it's hot, okay? It's just real hot. She walks over one summer day, it's so hot, and she got on a jacket and a scarf. I said, Rebecca, you hot? She said, yes, I, but I can't believe how cool it's been lately. So what do you mean? It's hot. What do you mean it's been cool lately? She goes, no, I mean, yeah, I, I guess I have been feeling that, but my weather app's been saying it's 70 degrees. And I said, well, Rebecca, that's weird that your weather app's saying that, but when you walked over here, did you not feel that it was definitely not 70 degrees? She said, well, yeah, it did feel hot, but my weather app just keeps saying so I've been wearing my scarves and my jacket. I said, Rebecca. So I looked at this girl's phone. My sister's phone was set to a different city. <laughs> but Rebecca, instead of going outside and saying, it is hot, and actually trusting what she knew was right, she instead trusted what her phone told her. So instead of actually dressing cooler because she knew that was right, because her phone said it was 70 degrees, even though it was based out of a totally different context, she chose to believe what her phone said rather than what she actually felt. And we do that all the time. We get into situations and even though our spirit is turning, we're like something is not right because culture says it's right. We're like, well, I guess it's okay. Because culture says it's because everybody's doing it because they're a Christian too. I guess it's okay even though everything in our spirit is saying this is not okay. And you know why you have that and not everybody else does? It's because if you are found in Jesus Christ, the trajectory of your life, you, this is not your home. Like you're heavenward bound. Like you, if you believe that Jesus Christ is actually the Son of God and he has saved your life, he's forgiven you of your sins and that Spirit of God has come down and he dwells within your life, then of course you're gonna look different than the world as you should. It's gonna feel different. You're gonna be convicted of things other people are not gonna be convicted by. But it's up to you to trust your convictions. No one else can do that for you. Only you can do that. You're responsible to discern the spirit. The next thing that I see in this story is so interesting. Why would they choose Barabbas? Why would they choose Barabbas over Jesus? I think the second thing is, is because the majority did. Because the majority chose it. Just like I'm just saying, because the culture did it, because the world did it, because everybody else was doing it, it just seemed like the right thing to do. Why did Pilate say, okay, I'll let you have Barabbas instead of Jesus? Because everybody else was saying it. And if you don't have a solid truth that you're standing on, your truth will form to whatever the majority says is true. Your truth will form to whatever TikTok tells you is right. Your truth will form to whatever the headline of the news says. Your truth will form to whatever politics you catch wind of. Your truth will you know, form to whatever Instagram's trends are. Your truth will form to what the majority says is true if you do not have a solid foundation of truth. I was on Instagram one day and um, I was seeing this influencer that I love to follow. She always has cute clothes, cute little family. So I'm scrolling through her story. And I was so caught off guard by this story because I was so with her at the beginning of it. So she starts the story off by saying, you know, I was watching the Wonder Woman movie the other day and I'm like, love Wonder Woman, totally here for this. And she's like, and it was just so good. And I was just so empowered by watching this movie. And I thought, this is so great because I felt like what every little boy must have felt like when they were watching Superman. I was like, yeah, that is cool, you know, that's awesome. We have Wonder Woman, that's great. So I'm following her, we're tracking. Then she says, and then I thought to myself, you know, maybe that's why I don't relate to God, because he's a man. And maybe, maybe because he's a man, that's why I don't relate to him. And then I'm like, hold up, that took a turn. And then she's like, she's like, but then I started doing some research and I found about this thing called Heavenly Mother. And it's just been so great. So I've been praying to Heavenly Mother and all, you know, I've got, got my kids on it. They're praying to Heavenly Mother. And it's just been so empowering for our family. It's just been so great. And I'm like, whoa. So then she leads it up to a little Q&A. If anybody has questions, please ask. So a lot of people have questions. Some people are like, this is awesome. I'm so glad you told me about this. I've been struggling with that too. I'm gonna pray to Heavenly Mother. And then someone literally asked her, I'm so glad she responded to it so I could see this. They said, 
that's really cool, but where does it say this in scripture? And she literally on video says, well, I haven't actually found it in scripture yet, but if you guys do, please let me know because this has been awesome. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, you know, that's crazy. And she's leading, she has millions of followers and she's sitting here telling all of her fans about Heavenly Mother and how empowering it is if you're a female and you can't relate to God. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, man, there's so many things I wanna speak to with that. First of all, I just wanna encourage you. This is the big difference in my truth and the truth. My truth is always seeking your own empowerment. But see, the truth, when I, when I bow to the truth, I am not looking when I pray to God for my empowerment. I'm calling upon the power of God. See, I don't need to be empowered. I need God's power in my life because in my greatest empowerment, I cannot do the things I am desperate for God to do in this world. So I don't need to be empowered. I need God's power. And when I have God's power, Man, yes, I feel empowered, but it's not about me. It's about God. The second thing that I thought was crazy about this is, again, the reason the truth is powerful is because it's true. The reason praying to God is powerful is because there's actually a Father in heaven who responds to his children's prayers. That's why it's powerful. In our world, we wanna come up with all of these different things and manifest things and Heavenly Mother and this and that, but y'all, we're losing the power. It warns about this in scripture in 2 Timothy 4. It says, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have itching ears, and they will accumulate for themselves teaching to suit their own passions, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. I mean, it says it right there in scripture, this is gonna happen, but you have to have the ears to hear that, because if you don't, you're gonna be scrolling through Instagram and say, well, that's a great idea. That makes sense, maybe that's why I don't relate to God. But you say, no, that's not true, I can relate to God because God made male and female in his image. God knit me together in my mother's womb. Yes, I can relate to my heavenly father. You know, like you have to back that up with truth. And if you're questioning it, then read it in scripture. She said, I haven't found it in scripture. Look, I would give her that if we didn't have Google. I'd be like, it's a big book. It might take some time to find it. You know, I'm scrolling through Heavenly Mother, Heavenly Mother. But like, you can literally like, you can Google this. So I took it to Google myself. Fact check, why not? So I Google, is there anywhere in scripture where there is a Heavenly Mother? Did not find that. But in Jeremiah 44, there's something called the Queen of Heaven. And I felt like this was actually a relatable thing to read. So first of all, in Jeremiah 44, God's basically speaking to these people in the city of Jerusalem with, Ju with Judah, and he's saying, y'all have gone totally astray. Like, the reason why all these bad things are happening is because y'all have been sacrificing other gods, you've been calling upon other gods, and that is why y'all are in the trouble that you're in. Obviously, that's paraphrasing. Go read it for yourself, but that's basically what God was saying. But then, this is their response to God when they say, whenever God says this. Jeremiah 44, 17. But we will do everything we have vowed, making offerings to the queen of heaven and pour out drink offerings to her as we did. Both we and our fathers, our kings, our officials. Once again, you see the majority rules thing here? We all did it. We're all praying to heavenly mother. We're all praying to the queen of heaven. We're all giving all these things to the queen of heaven. Then it says, for then, so for when we were praying to the queen of heaven, we had plenty of food and prospered and saw no disaster, but, <laughs> Since we left off making offerings to the queen of heaven and pouring out drink offerings to her, we have lacked everything and have been consumed by famine and sword. So basically, they're telling God, no, no, you don't understand. When we were praying to the queen of heaven, everything was so good. Everything was going so right. It was, it was great, we had all this stuff. But then when we stopped praying to the queen of heaven, now we don't have everything. So they're telling God, no, I think you missed it. Everything was good when we were praying, but now it's not good. And God's like, that's exactly what I'm saying because she wasn't responding to y'all. And one commentator said of this, I thought it was so good, they said if they had even the slightest understanding of spiritual things, they would know their analysis is crazy. Things were going great when we were you know, going against God and praying to this queen until the judgment of God came. You see, sin is often good until the wages of sin are paid death. Sin is going to feel good in the moment. It's gonna feel good when you're doing it, when everything feels comfortable, when everything feels right, when everybody's doing it, it's gonna feel good until the wages of sin are paid death. There is a path that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. It might seem right, doesn't mean it is right. 
Like tonight, if we got all the donuts in the world in this room and we all ate them like crazy, no holding back, eat as many as you want. Seriously, everybody went crazy. It would be so much fun. And we would have a heck of a time. We would eat so much donuts, we'd be laughing, it'd be fun. But tomorrow we would feel absolutely horrible. And you know what nobody would say? We gotta get back to the time we were eating all the donuts. It was so much fun. Everything was going great when we were stuffing our faces. We were laughing, we were having a good time. Cheers, one more donut. No, nobody would literally say that. We would say that was a horrible idea. Let's literally never do that again because the consequences of that are bad. And when I say the donut analogy, everybody is like, duh. But in life, we're like, run it back. <laughs> Let's go back out tomorrow night. Let's get back on our phone. Let's go back into the relationship. Let's go back to when it was good. Don't go back. Don't go back. Empty promises, false truth. It's not real, no, no power in that. Go forward, repent, turn, try something new, go to Jesus. People say, you know, following Jesus isn't fun. Oh my gosh, I have so much more fun following Jesus than I did when I was living worldly. There's nothing more fun than having peace. There's nothing more fun than having joy that's a strength. There's nothing more fun than knowing you're loved. There is nothing more fun than walking confidently in who you're created to be because of who your creator is. Yeah. That is so much fun. Yeah. Don't go back. Why would you choose Barabbas when you could have Jesus? You know, when I was studying that about Jesus and Barabbas, I was looking into Barabbas's life and I found out that he wasn't just a murderer. It actually says that he was a murderer, so he stole things. It said, sorry, he was a murderer, he killed people. He was a robber, he, he, stole, he stole things from people. And he also was a rebel, so he was very destructive. And when I looked at all those things that he was accountable for, I thought it was so interesting, because there's a verse in John 10, 10, and it says, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And all of those things Barabbas had done. Kill, steal, and destroy. He was a murderer, he was a robber, he was a rebel. And then Jesus says, but I come to give life and life to the full. So here in this picture, we have two people up here. One came to steal, kill, and destroy. One was a robber, a murderer, and a rebel. And the other one came to give life and life to the full. Now, when you read John 10, 10, no one would say, I want the thief. No one. You would say, of course not. Give me Jesus. Give me the life. But when you put the two up there in human form, and one's a lot more comfortable, even though, yeah, he's a thief. Yeah, he's a murderer, yeah, but we can deal with him. We can handle him, right? But the one that came to give life and life to the full, he requires me to change. He requires me to deny myself, to pick up my cross. He requires something of me, but yet at the same time, he is everything to me. Yeah, at the same time, he has a hope for me and a future for me. And when you put it like that, and you think about, man, why have I been choosing Barabbas? Why do I choose the enemy's plan for my life over God's plan for my life? Unintentionally doing that, I'm not sitting here thinking I'm gonna choose the enemy's plan. I'm not sitting here literally thinking I'm gonna choose Barabbas. But why are we doing that? Maybe for you, it's your feelings. Maybe your feelings got in the way. Maybe it's what the majority said. Maybe it's the crowd, maybe it's the culture. Maybe it's you not taking a second to actually read the scripture and get to know who this Jesus is. Maybe it's you assuming Jesus is one way because that's what everybody said, but not getting to know him personally for yourself. Like what's been keeping you from choosing Jesus? Jesus. 